Um, so early interest when I was like um, like in the early 2000s. So I like to watch documentaries. And one of the documentaries that resonated with me was talking about like um, uh, human vision and, and perception. So uh, what make a baseball player good at what they do is that they don't just see the ball coming, but they can predict where it is and uh, and what speed it's coming at, and then they would hit the ball. So what makes a good batter would be not just the physical fitness, but their, let's say, prediction uh, fitness or uh, uh, like mental abilities. There was another like uh, article on uh, like on the BBC News uh, uh, in the early 2000s as well that talked how zebra finches um, they they rehearse their songs in their sleep and that's like um, having a neural network improve uh, when it's idle. So that's that's where I think my passion for AI and perception grew. Um, back at the time, this was in 2006, well, after I finished my high school, not much options were uh, open for me. Um, I think girls today are much luckier. They have engineering. Uh, I had passion for physics, but I also like to use computers. So I thought the best option for me at the time was to join the information technology department at King Saud University. Um, it gave me many of the skills that I, well, uh, use today and I benefit from. Um, one of the courses that I took at this program was the human computer interaction course. Um, and this course was different from all the other courses that I've taken. It merged psychology and computers together along, uh, like having things beyond the screen. So it talked about the ergonomics and the human factors of designing products that are digital or interactive, haptic systems and robotics. For example, um, the Kismet was one of the cases that we discussed in class. The professor who led this uh, course um, uh, left me with a lot of questions as I leave the room every time uh, I attend their class. And that's where I think my love for research grew. And um, coincidentally, with, with that time, uh, the human computer interaction research group as well was uh, the first research group and the university that was open for undergraduate students to attend. So I was lucky to attend like seminars at a very um, early phase in my uh, like uh, academic uh, journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was also invited to give a talk based on the many questions I used to leave my uh, professor with. I used to send lengthy emails um, oh, yeah, after, yeah. like at the end of each week. And I, I'm, I'm surprised they have the time to answer them given their busy schedule. So um, as before I graduated, my capstone project was a document image for language identification. And to simplify what the project was about, so if you are familiar with optical character recognition, so these are like um, algorithms that transform uh, images uh, where it has text into them into tangible text that you can modify and edit. But the one problem with these uh, algorithms that you, they have to be like defined with the language that they that they solve for. So what we did is we had this tool uh, based on uh, Ahmed al Gamal's uh, paper um that would automatically select the language so it could detect a language so the same way when we look at a text and say um oh, looks arabic or english or chinese i might not know the language but i can um uh, recognize the characters or uh, the text or the uh, script that is written we have used different methods for this so we used kernel density functions and peak detection uh, for horizontal profiles and we also used the moments um, for the vertical profiles using a very simple neural network structure at that time this was in 2010 and 2011 there wasn't much resources on the topic as we have today. We didn't even have much tools. Um, and I had to learn MATLAB all on my own. Uh, and it was a very interesting journey. Um, and and it was nice to see like you write this simple code, like relatively to its ability. And it's able to tell you, well, it's Arabic, it's English. And, and that I think um, made me more uh, passionate about the domain of computer vision. Sometimes what we know gets in the way of what we need to learn. And that, and that kind of way of thinking uh, of what we are used to do um, usually gets in the way. So we're usually sometimes clouded by experience. 
my interactions uh, like uh, trying to try different that kind of domains also working with interns i always try to put this quote at the back of my mind um so i joined cax uh, uh, briefly after I graduated as a developer and a year later as a researcher. It's been 10 years as a researcher and to thrive at CAX, you have to have the ability to self-learn, to have initiative and to um, have discipline to, to thrive and develop solutions. Uh, as it, in a team formation and as a, your, uh, on your own. So I like this because it also has a robot in it. So this is the NASA's curiosity. So I like to follow curiosity, my curiosity. So if you have a question, rather than just thinking about it, it's good to play and toy with it. So with my first paycheck, I remember buying this Spark Fun Inventors Kit. So I don't know, raise of hands if you know what an Arduino is. I assume a lot of people do. Yeah, so... To, to make it simple, so uh, for those who are not familiar with it, so an Arduino is a microcontroller electronic um, uh, like interface that helps you to uh, do electronics, so I'll say, easier uh, in an easy way uh, compared with like you don't have you need you don't need to have an engineering background to to use it, but you should know a little. So uh, having that um, helps like helps to do different kind of projects. So when I bought this yeah, kit, I remember opening it for the first time. And these electronics look <laughs> real. Like they're not the kind of things you see in a Lego kit. So I remember opening it several times and putting it back again. I was like, I'm not ready for this. And then I was like, I should I should over overcome my fear of 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 like um, not starting and not learning. So I I went over this and I lighted my first LEDs. You know the feeling of flow world for electronics, I assume. Uh, and this um, led me to different things that I've tried. And one of the things I placed this week on Twitter, where I like just put the temperature of my room. Uh, and then I got a request by the uh, Human Computer Interaction Lab, which is later named uh, Scourge, the Software and Knowledge Engineering Research Group, to join their project. So what they had is a path planning simulated annealing uh, algorithm uh, to uh, go navigate a room given um, like uh, blueprints of the, of the floor. And what they did, all they had was simulation. And they wanted me to make this robot move. So they were like, we want it to be real. And we want you to do this for us. So I also joined, uh, this is a joint effort between actually, uh, like also a lab in King Saud to uh, manufacture, you see the plastic parts over there are manufactured by a different lab. But they, but they improved on our initial design. So we had something with wood. I had two injuries in this project, but uh, at least at the end, we have something that works. And we published a paper um, towards the end of it. So um, I promised myself that this experience with the Arduino made me feel different and see programming in a different way. Things go beyond the screen. So I decided to, if I had the opportunity, I would share this kind of experience with others. And I was approached with, with by two entities, and 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 it was it was uh, it and it fruited with <coughs> sorry it fruited with uh, designing a. Arduino kit. At that time, this was in 2012, 2013, and uh, there wasn't much kits at the time. Even the Arduino kit was not released at that time. So we needed to make a low cost, um, something a bit different. If it lays in the lab, people can still do more with it, not just the things you find in books and tutorials and LEDs. So we did a, I did a kit guide, and uh, our first run of the workshop, we published a paper on our experience. And uh, this was over 30 workshops over the past uh, seven to eight years. And uh, I lost count, to be honest. Um, so these are just snapshots of the workshops. So just before I went to my master's, um, uh, one of the uh, lecturers in King Saud University, I think she's a uh, PhD here, Lema Sum. So we worked jointly to try to, <laughs> yeah, okay. So we worked jointly on trying to 
make robotics uh, and programming fun for uh, freshman students. So they're their first year. They don't know how to program. They're just learning to do hello world and print uh, messages on the screen. So we're trying to teach them and to brighten their horizon on how to on how to uh, look at problems differently. And the thing is, we didn't teach them like the robot concepts, but we wanted them to feel them. So we, we built this map, uh, sorry, uh, we built this maze in the middle of the campus, uh, like in the middle of the, sorry, the college. And then the students would uh, work on their projects while people are passing by. And you'd see people coming around and watching the creations of the students and they just pull out these robots and then they try to reprogram them, try to put that kind of sense of localizing the robot, understanding where they are in the maze. I think we had two who escaped the maze, which was which was cool. So um, I, I came up with a proposal. I submitted to three people back in uh, 2014. Two people said, this is, this is a bit expensive. I don't think you can do it. So it was for um, detecting frustration. The idea is inspired by how sometimes we're frustrated by technology. So we want to press a button, but accidentally we press another and all our information is erased. And sometimes you observe certain users have these kind of frustration uh, hand gestures that goes on them. So one thought that came to my mind is, why couldn't the computer see that I'm frustrated and just take a step forward, uh, backwards? And uh, this proposal was sent again to three people. Two thought it was impossible or expensive to make. The third person, returned it back to me as a concept paper that oh, well, you're ready to publish this uh, you have a paper you just need to publish it so i published this uh, my third paper and ironically i got funded by the same people who rejected my paper so uh, that was really nice and i also got uh, eight interns to work on this project um so uh, this is just like a, an interactive table made with like low cost. This is a table projector and a connect sensor. Um, so the interns built like a tic-tac-toe um, game and uh, they were able to detect the hand and the fingers. Um, but their question was, what kind of gestures should we detect? So that was a very important question since hand gestures are influenced by culture. So we decided to do a Wizard of Oz experiment. Who is here for, uh, familiar with the movie Wizard of Oz? Okay. So um, to, to give a, a, gen like a clear idea of the concept. So, uh, spoilers at the end of the movie, they reach to the wizard, uh, which they discover later is just a man behind the curtain. And it's the exact same thing that we're doing here. So so we have our participants uh, uh, standing by the X mark, and then we have for the facilitator, myself, and the wizard was one of the interns. But the participant should not see the wizard. The wizard is behind the curtain. So, um, so the participants should only see themselves or a reflection or anything, but not the wizard is himself. And and that's that's what we did uh, in in the lab. So. Uh, we built a portable lab that can fold in the back of a car, and uh, the wizard would sit uh, quietly uh, behind the curtain and um, and and manipulate the um, uh, the game as the participant is uh, interacting with the surface. Uh, this helps us understand the gestures in a very free form, um, and we were all I like told by our participants in the study, like, you have a really good sensor, it really could tell what we're doing. I was like, yeah, it's a human behind the glass. Um, so not all who wander are lost. Uh, questions lead to, I think, better, even nice experiments. Um, and by 2016, I started uh, my uh, master's uh, in artificial intelligence at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I took a couple of courses in introduction uh, to vision and robotics, advanced vision, and where we did like object detection and classification, or object detection and uh, tracking and behavior um, behavior uh, recognition. Um, what I like, though, about when th this part of the course, the ro robotics part or the control part of the robotics course, is that I got to employ control methods, control theory on this Lego robot. I never knew that 
that something like this is possible. I always looked at these as toys, but I never knew their potential. Uh, it was nice to draw graphs and plot them with MATLAB. This is this is at the end of the course, and you can see me here uh, sitting. I don't know if it's clear with the with the projector. So my thesis was bio-inspired super resolution skyline navigation. And to keep things simple, uh, it's relative to, a, let's say, a, a relative visual compass. So say you take a snapshot today, I'm facing, uh, for example, 10 degrees north, and I come tomorrow, I want to face 10 degrees north, but for some reason I'm shifted for like uh, 3 degrees or 5 degrees, and then I would want to know this kind of uh, uh, change or an orientation. Uh, this is used when you're, like, for example, doing path following or you're doing like this land problem. This, this comes useful, so you keep following the same path. Um, the bio inspiration part comes from the snapshot model that insects do. So, uh, like for example, one paper mentions that an ant have like a seven days of memory of, of images that goes along this path. Uh, and um, in, in these scenarios, I'm talking about desert ants. Um, and there was one with the downscaling, so we take the the omatidia, like the uh, eyes of the uh, insects are made of these small lenses, and then uh, these lenses have these features, so we take the features from these lenses, which is already in the literature, and we try to do the downscaling to be relative, to have a resolution of an image relative to that. Um, we assume, based on, on one paper, that insects rotate uh, the images in their brains. Uh, of course, we cannot interview an insect and ask them if they do that, but we assume that they do that. So we take panoramic images and we take them and we compare them and we do downscaling in between. Um, so one big problem in my research was there was no data. So I had to do data regeneration at the beginning. So I made this grass looking um, grass looking uh, data set. This didn't much tell me about what I was trying to figure out. Sorry. I then take the, um, uh, the MITC sales data set and this also didn't tell me what's going on. The problem is I'm using the same image twice. So I wanted to have a simulator or something which I didn't have but I decided to well collect my own images. So uh, in Edinburgh uh, you have really nice scenery so I took this, uh, 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 I don't know if the, I don't know why it's repeated, but uh, so this is, this is a pan tilt system and the camera is mounted at the top and then I get to rotate it to known degrees. So I built this pan tilt system using Arduino. This is where my Arduino skills comes to hand. And, uh, and then I compare two different images and then I know, yeah, so this was, this was 115 degrees or this was, 20, 45 degrees, and I know that it was working properly. So this all inspired me to that, that like uh, working and admiring nature through, through research. And I have phobia with insects, but I decided to break this for, for, for the sake of research. So when I returned, this is a gaboon. I don't know if you're familiar with the insect. This is a darkling uh, beetle. Um, for Saudis see it uh, in the desert and they play with it when they were young. Uh, but uh, so I held one, so I feel brave. Uh, so uh, joining the Center of Robotics was the first step I did when I returned for my master's. Uh, that's in CAXT. And um, the director at the time told me, well, Arwa, you have to learn ROS. And it was a really nice tool that I'm still, uh, I still appreciate the, the advice because I, I find it very useful in my work today. Um, sorry, I'm going backward. Okay, so I aside ROS, so ROS is like the more development, but the concepts behind perception and uh, like cognition that goes into a robot um, has to be complemented with the skills of development that I have. So I also took more courses online. So this was where I controlled the Mars rover to do like SLAM, where it navigates Mars and collect and localize these rocks. And the other one is the ETH uh, Zurich, I think Emilio um, Perzuli's course, and where um, uh, we do all these kind of things for autonomous cars. Uh, I was awarded the warrior title because I will uh, had a lot of submissions on the leaderboard, <laughs> uh, and I was awarded this special deck that you see at the bottom. So um, at the same time, 
I like internship and I like to deal with interns. And when I came to the center of robotics, I noticed that this domain is different from many other domains because it requires you to have this uh, interdisciplinary knowledge. And you have to work with people of different domains and speak different languages. And this is where I decided uh, with, with my team that we need to run this kind of a program. So this is the STAR program and where interns from different backgrounds, mechanical engineers, electrical engineering, computer science, and, uh, and like these all interns work together and they're divided into small groups. So uh, this was done in 10 weeks. So of course the designs are not ours, okay? So these are open source uh, robots, but however, the designs are modified to, to become more robust, to fit uh, our well equipment since it was a, a low budget uh, project. And um, this is a, a gate cycle for trotting. So this is the, our interns work. So they see all these kind of dogs moving. Uh, we call this the Lynx project or Al Washaq project. They had an, a, a wild idea to do with it. So the, the idea is alongside their understanding of robotics is that how can you benefit of these robots for social good? So they also filed uh, or say filled uh, patent forms of their ideas of how they can use these robots for social good. So this one was mainly for uh, dissertation and agriculture. And uh, the other one, the fish, tra fish tracking one is uh, actually coupled with another robot that mimics the movement of the fish. So it does like, uh, it has a kinematic model. Um, the, thing, the thing with this one is that they built a data set to help people learn computer vision under given uh, like reflectance uh, there is like occlusion. There is another one with two fish and in, in they had, we had the pets in our lab. So we had to feed the fish uh, and take it with us over the weekend. Um, the last one is the uh, Lati Coda or the Coda project. So this is a snake project. The, again, this is the design is online. It's on Instructables and it was modified to uh, fit the components that we had. And uh, I just talked to Christina and I told her that our interns were inspired by her work in selecting the idea behind what they wanted to do with the robot. So the Lati Coda, sorry. So the Lati Coda had three, um, three locomotions. Uh, one was going uh, in the uh, X axis or the Y axis. And the other one is side winding. So if you put it on the floor, it will be moving sideways. Uh, it is 10 segments, but the videos that we have in, in our documentation are, I think, four or five. So these interns, uh, I'm proudly, I'm like, I feel like their mother. So, uh, so they, they, uh, they're all in prestigious places right now, uh, and they all like uh, participate in these competitions, and they keep winning. So this is one of the teams, and they won the first place in the Tabadil Hackathon. Um, they even have a budget higher than their projects. Um, so I, know I want to talk about today. So where are we today? So the Spatial Artificial Intelligence Lab, we work around three main pillars, so research, development, and innovation, and we have just established officially, uh, not officially, officially, but I mean, in the center. So we have navigation, grasping, collaborative robotics, and industry 4.0 and industry 5.0, so because we're tackling collaborative robotics. And then uh, we, are, we are aiming to use machine learning and deep learning methods to, to complement these domains along with bio-inspiration and biomimicry. Um, at the same time, it's a social, I think, responsibility to have community outreach. So we have internship program, uh, programs, we have workshops and seminars and mentorship. And this is all supported by CAXT. Um, so what am I doing now? So I'm designing and building a bio-inspired robot system for agri-tech application. Uh, I'm also building and uh, uh, building a decentralized collaborative system, case studies for, ind for industrial applications and demonstrations. Um, so maybe one thing I want to tell those who want to start, uh, of, of probably one, maybe someone who's interested in the domain, um, let your passion and love for learning be your compass and motivation, but there is always struggle. So a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Arwa. 
Uh, in the interest of time, we can take one question. Okay. Okay, that will be faster without questions. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Arwa. Uh, you want to give the gift? Yes. We have a gift for you. Okay, and we have a... Uh, we have a lost and found, last drive, orange, found and cast in. If anybody lost flash drive, we have it here. Okay, our uh, next speaker is a founding member of Kaust. Uh -huh. And I wish. You're, you're, you're not Actually, next. I wish not. Professor. <laughs> you, are you lost, sir? There's a problem with this drive. Scan the drive now and fix no, no, it. Fine.